Walt. <laughs> I love that jacket on your piece. Thank you. What are you doing? What are you doing? Thank you. What are you doing? Yeah, I'm just like, I'm doing a panoramic shot. Okay. You're just going to slowly, yeah. so we all are super wide. It's called video. It's this new oh, technology. I don't do that. It is? Hi, Mom. Where's Prince? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's get my she can't hear you. Mm -hmm. She's dead. I thought you could hear all of them. Ready. Still hear me. Oh, now. He created you in his image. And since God is love and God doesn't make mistakes, then you must be exactly the way he wants you to be, the way he intended you to be. It was one of the most groundbreaking shows in TV history. Good boy. In 2000, Queer as Folk gave audiences something they'd never seen. A raw, honest, sometimes voyeuristic. We want to show? But always fearless celebration of gay life in America. You go, girl! Everyone smile, please. 18 years later, EW is bringing the cast of Queer as Folk back together for an unforgettable reunion. <laughs> it's been amazing. I've been I've cried like five times today. I'm so happy to see everyone. But that's every day for Peter Page. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to cry five times, but I didn't want to ruin my makeup. <laughs> that is the truest thing ever. The following program. Modern style. You better get this thing repainted before you go into the office. I'm not having it repainted. Are you crazy? No, they are. Well, I say, f They can ride a neon across the sky. Start it! <laughs> the story of Queer as Folk began back in 1999 with British TV producer Russell T. Davies. Russell T. Davies first made a name for himself in England, producing primetime soap operas, and later he'd go on to help reboot the Doctor Who franchise. But in the late 90s, he launched Queer as Folk, which was this hyper-realistic series about gay men living in Manchester. I should give London another go. I look around this place. I've had them all. You haven't had me. Uh, there was the once. The series really dove into what it was like to live as part of the gay community in Manchester, which is where Davies himself had lived at one point. It didn't shy away from showing that drugs and sex were really a part of the lifestyle. I don't kiss. Yeah, right. These uh, characters had a sexual life, which was shown, which was shocking at that point, because if you know on television... It shocked us. We, we did couldn't it. believe what we were seeing. Queer as Folk really went for it. In the very first episode, there's an intense sex scene between a teenager and a much older man. All right, well, thanks for that. Gotta go. This was very controversial, of course, and networks in the US started to take notice. Executives at Showtime believed Queer as Folk could find an audience in America. In 2000, the network greenlit a US version and hired Ron Cowan and Daniel Lipman to develop the project. The Emmy award-winning writer-producers were best known for creating the long-running NBC family drama, Sisters. We were doing a show at Showtime, and we were just about to go into production. And on a uh, Friday, we got the call that all the financing had fallen through. So there we were without a show. So we didn't know what to do. So we went to Italy, which was wonderful. And when we came back, the day we came back was a Sunday, and there was the calendar section of the LA Times. And, it's, and the headline was, the, the best show that America will never see. And it was all about Queer as Folk. And we read this, uh, and the, in the article it said that Showtime wanted to do it as a, as a continuing series. It said uh, no one will ever see it here because they won't have the courage to do it, because it was obviously a very uh, explicit, daring show. So we went to Jerry Offsay, who at that time was running Showtime, and said, would you consider us to do it? Um, and uh, he did, and that's how we got the job. We read about it in the paper. Have you ever wondered, is this the life God wants for me? Well, I suppose in his infinite wisdom, he decided somebody had to live in Pittsburgh. The American version of the show was set in Pittsburgh, but it was still a very realistic depiction of what it was like to live as a gay man in an urban setting. Let's check out the bar, maybe that guy you made me lose is there. I didn't make you lose him. The challenge was to meet uh, the British show or go beyond it, but we said to Showtime, you certainly can't wimp out and do less. Uh, there'd be no reason 
to do it. Hey, Todd, how's it going? Fine. We got no pushback from Showtime. Um, there was, what was their, what was their motto? Um, no limits. No limits, that's uh, we, right. We tested it. <laughs> that's for sure. No, the, the, the uh, reason- They earned their motto. They wanted it to be controversial. They, they wanted it to be provocative. This is what they wanted. We weren't provocative for provocative sake. We just tried to be honest. Queer as yeah. Folk was and is a celebration of gay life. And um, we wanted to be very positive. We wanted to be entertaining and funny as well as dramatic and intriguing. So um, they were very supportive of us in that. I just want you to know that you can count on me for anything, day or night. This was an opportunity to really write about gay people, give them some depth and address issues that had never been shown on TV before. Gay people don't really see a reflection of themselves very often on TV that really has any substance and that's even remotely flattering. Usually you're portrayed as a eunuch or a clown. Well, if I, if I may add too that uh, this was the first, going to be the first dramatic series with gay characters in the leads. The roles would be historic, but finding actors to play them wasn't easy. The reason they didn't come in is because their agents told them not to come in. Not one of the major agencies sent any actors into the show. Everyone we found was either unknown, didn't even have representation. Uh, we really had to scrounge around to find people who were even willing to come in back then to do a part on a gay show. My friend's staying with me temporarily since the hooker who lived down the hall from him burned his apartment building down two years ago. Two years is a long time to be temporary. And yet it hasn't interfered with my love life, which I suppose says a lot about my love life. Eventually, Hal Sparks was cast as the comic book obsessed Michael Novotny. The 31-year-old actor had spent a year as the host of Ease Talk Soup. Hey folks, I'm Hal Sparks, host, pastry chef, adventure seeker and was coming off a role in the hit comedy, Dude, Where's My Car? Soon we will leave this lame planet and fly through outer space with cool aliens who like us. Michael is this very sweet and charming comic book nerd. He's a little insecure and can be a little whiny, but very endearing. I've never seen so many comic books. That's what everybody I bring home said. I mean, people have told me that. We see him at the beginning of the series working at a Kmart-esque store called The Big Q, but eventually he goes on to fulfill his dream of opening a comic book store. I'm so proud of you, Michael. I don't want to burst your bubble, Mom, but I'm not exactly going to become a gazillionaire selling comics. I, like everybody else here, was shooting Dude, Where's My Car when I got the script. And, um, <laughs> um, and my, my agent manager at the time, who I'm no longer with, uh, for the record, which is pivotal to this, um, presented the script to me like they were wearing hazmat suits and they were carrying it with salad tongs. Like, like, it's a hit in England, I don't know. We don't recommend it, but you get mad if we don't let you read stuff. And um, they gave me the pilot script for it and I, it just existed. Like, you know, when I read it, I was like, I, I know, there's Michael. Can you lie down on your back? Um, sure, on my back. Okay, I know what he looks like. I know what he sounds like. I know what he moves like. I know he hesitates when he walks into a room. This is my favorite position. I'm just kidding. Ugh. You just knew reading it. You're like, this is important. This is just important. This has to be done. It has to be done well. And if I can contribute to that, that will be, you know, a, a gift in my life that I've been given. Tarring excited. All systems go. See you later, man. Michael's best friend, Brian Kenny, was played by 31-year-old Gail Harold. Brian is the best friend of Michael, and they've been that way since childhood. When he starts off the series, he's an advertising executive working at Vanguard. The difference between our beer and their beer is that our beer says sex. Out of the office, Brian is all about sex. Actually, even in the office, he's all about sex. And he's only for one night stands and moving on to the next conquest. Who the hell are you? I'm the guy you f***ed last night. I had actually seen a good bit of the original on some VHS tapes that I was shown. And it was Manchester, it was very charming. I thought Aidan Gillen was an incredible performer in that part. And this sort of swaggering anti-hero, you know? So that had already kind of gotten into my 
into my consciousness. But that was months, maybe almost a year before this ever came around. And my first reaction was, even before I read the script, there's no way that they're going to do this in the United States. I mean, it doesn't make sense. No one's going to allow it to happen. They'll never, even if they do agree to do it, they won't push it that far. And then I read the script and I could see that there was something there. Come on, Mikey. Let's fly. I'm Superman. I'll show you the world. Why am I always Lois Lane? I was so blown away by that script. I held that script up the first time I walked in there and I was like, are you, are we doing this? Are we doing this? Because we're doing this, I'm in. To let you know what life was like for gay people. Back then you couldn't get married. Okay, DOMA was still in effect. Uh, don't ask, don't tell, the army. Um, in 14 states, there were still, still sodomy laws on the books. The President of the United States at that time stood in the Rose Garden and said he wanted to change the Constitution of the United States. I believe in the sanctity of marriage. I believe a marriage is between a man and a woman. And I think we ought to uh, codify that one way or the other. And we've got lawyers looking at the best way to do that. So that was the atmosphere we, we were working in. In 2000, Showtime greenlit an American version of the controversial British drama, Queer as Folk. Fabulous. Hal Sparks and Gail Harold signed on to play childhood best friends, Michael Novotny and Brian Kenny. How's it going? Just uh, checking out the bars, you know? The role of high school senior Justin Taylor went to 23-year-old newcomer Randy Harrison. When we first meet Justin, he is this naive 17-year-old kid who's eager to jump into the gay scene. He loses his virginity to Brian. What is with kids today? I just want to get laid like everybody else. But instead of allowing Brian to move on to the next conquest, he really ingratiates himself to the crowd, and Brian and Justin's relationship becomes a linchpin to the whole series. There's no turning back. I just wanted to be a part of gay representation on television. I'd grown up in the 90s and there was some stuff, but it wasn't enough. And I was hungry as a teenager coming to terms with my own sexuality for media that was reflective in any way of what my experience was or what I wanted my experience to be. And so when the script came along and the opportunity to be a part of it was presented to me, I mean, it was important to me politically and personally. The problem with perfection is its inability to recognize anything less perfect than itself. In other words, you hit on him and he turned you down. Scott Lowell played Ted Schmidt, an accountant with serious self-esteem issues. The 35-year-old actor had already appeared in the hit TV shows Early Edition, Caroline in the City, and Frasier. Well, Chuck, who else is on the line? Well, Dr. Quain, <laughs> we have Linda on line three, who believes people are laughing at her. Ted is presented as the most average looking of the friends, and he often faces a lot of rejection and has a lot of insecurity because of that. We listen to you? What? Always putting yourself down. Well, better me than them, I'm gentler. We get to see him go on a journey through the series, though, as he kind of finds his way and his own happiness. I read the script for Queer's Folk, and uh, similar like what everyone said, I couldn't believe that this was going to be on television. But uh, in reading this character, who in the breakdown in the description was chubby and balding, um, <laughs> uh, I uh, don't tell him. I just <laughs> he doesn't know. I just, I mean, I just recognized so much of myself in him because I had just moved to Los Angeles recently and everything he was experiencing uh, going through the world. I mean, Los Angeles is just a big gay club in so many ways that it's a world where, where beauty and youth and success are things that are prized. And I'd had like the very first scene he has of being at this bar and trying to talk to these beautiful guys walking by him. Hey, how you doing? Good, glad to hear it. And they're just, he's a ghost to them. Hey, how's it going? Hi, no complaints, thanks. And he kind of just starts talking to himself and it's like, hey, hey, whatever it is. And I, that had just happened to me like a week before when I had been at a party and some very attractive ladies were walking by and I was like, hi, how are you? And they're just nothing. I didn't exist. And I just understood him so psychologically of where he was coming from and, uh, and, all the voices in his head were voices in my head that I had somewhat learned to tap down. Um, 
but felt I could tap back up again pretty easily. Oh my God, that guy over there looks exactly like Matthew McConaughey. Maybe he smokes pot naked, excuse me. Peter Page co-starred as the flamboyant Emmett Honeycutt. The 31-year-old actor had a handful of TV credits on his resume, including Suddenly Susan, Caroline in the City, and Will and Grace. We met in Soho. It was the village. Gay Pride? Wigstock. Ah, uh, yes, I remember it well. <laughs> in a cage. On a box. Vodka neat? On the rocks. Ah, uh, yes, I remember it well. <laughs> Emmett is the um, self-titled queen of the group of friends. He goes through a lot of various jobs, often serving as the comedic relief for this series. I could be a, a, a real man if I wanted to. You know, just lower my voice, stop gesturing with my hands, talk about <laughs> nailing <laughs> and RBIs. But I'd rather my flame burn bright. Interestingly, I was the only person here, I think, who was brought in first to audition for a different role. I was brought in to read Debbie, for right? a Debbie. Yeah, I was brought in to read for Debbie. No, I was brought in to read for no, Ted. I'm... And um, I went in and I read for Ted and casting director said, I'm gonna, great, I'm gonna give you a call back. And I said, you know what, can I read Emmett for you? And she was like, did you not hear me? I said, I was gonna give you a call back. And I said, I know it's just a gut feeling, let me read for you. And I read and she said, I don't think I've ever said this before, but which role do you wanna come back for? And I said, and, and this was divine too, because I said, I don't, you know what, you brought me in for Ted, bring me back for Ted. And I went into the room to read for Dan and Ron, our EPs. Within 10 seconds, they were whispering to themselves, stop, 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 uh, stop, shh. You're wonderful. You're not Ted. Would you be interested in reading Emmett? And I looked at the casting director and I smiled and said, I'd be happy to. And I stepped outside for a second, I came back in. Um, and I, uh, I, I was so blown away by that script. I held that script up the first time I walked in the room and I was like, are you, are we doing this? Are we doing this? Because we're doing this, I'm in. Hi, we just happen to be in the neighborhood, so I... Are we interrupting something? Not at all. We're all done. The role of Lindsay Peterson, an art professor and new mom, went to Taya Gill. The 30-year-old Vancouver-born actress had been working in Canadian television for the past eight years. Lindsay is Brian's best friend from college, and when we first meet her, she's just given birth to her son, Gus, whose father, thanks to artificial insemination, is Brian. Oh my God. Say hello to your son. I read the script and I uh, responded, you know, very, uh, very strongly to the maternal aspects of, of Lindsay Peterson. And not only that, that she was a, a mother giving birth to a child, but that she was a, an out lesbian uh, living with a partner, uh, much to the uh, chagrin of her parents. And that conflict was interesting to me. You know, the whole point of this party was to prove they were just like you, so that you'd accept us the way that I've tried to accept you. I liked the relationship between Lindsay and Brian and that kind of close history that they shared and, uh, and how they developed a family together. You know you'll always be part of his life in the same way we'll always be part of each other's. And how eventually uh, the group of friends developed uh, a family together. And uh, that was all very, um, very powerful for me. You know, it's funny. I used to see these women feeding their kids and I think, ugh, what a turn off. But watching you, it's beautiful. Lindsay's lover, Melanie Marcus, was played by Michelle Clooney. Tell him to tell her what he looks like. Describe him. Uh. The 31-year-old actress had landed a small part as the police sketch artist in the 1995 classic, The Usual Suspects, along with a string of TV credits, including The Jeff Foxworthy Show, Boy Meets World, and ER. Why don't you come over later? Well, I don't want to come over later. I want to meet your friends, go to dinner, Richard, go see okay, a Richard, listen to me. All that is going to happen. When, Doug, when will it happen? Melanie is Lindsay's longtime girlfriend, and she's this tough lawyer, and when we start the series, she really doesn't like Brian. Oh, did we know he was coming? No, we did not know. Well, It'd be nice if you'd call first. But over the course of time, we get to see her kind of open up and show her more emotional side. The wedding's off. It's because of Lindsay. She... <laughs> she thinks the wedding's not supposed to happen because we're gay. Oh God, I had like $50 in my bank account and I got the script for Queer as Folk. And I'm sitting there on the couch I ended up selling for $50 to pay my rent, reading the script for Queer as Folk. And we get to um, the part where my character says, I don't care what men think about their d***s. <laughs> 
You're the one who decided to call off the bris. Of course, I know it's not very important to you or Brian, but it happens to be a very important ritual in my family. You know, there are a lot of men who think circumcision is a cruel and barbaric practice. I don't care what men think about their And you have to understand that female characters have come a long way since that show. And it was so exciting to me to see on, you know, in print, something that I'd always thought, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, let me at this character. This is mine. No one else is gonna play this but me. So are you going out cruising after you drop me off? No, I've been invited to an all-night orgy. Woo! Sounds hot. <laughs> Rounding out the cast was Sharon Gless as Michael's mother, Debbie. The 57-year-old actress was best known for her Emmy-winning role as the iconic Christine Cagney in the 80s police drama, Cagney and Lacey. First they stick one broad on me, then the other. What is it that you want from her, huh? You wanted to kiss your ring, is that it? Hey. Let me tell you something, you are not fit to carry that woman's lunch. Michael's mom, Debbie, is a waitress at the local diner. And unlike some of the other parents we meet in Queer as Folk, she's extremely supportive of Michael, to the point of even embarrassing him. Nobody knows if it's nature or nurture being gay. Now they're all saying you can tell by the length of the index finger. Although all of Michael's fingers are perfectly normal, you should have three kids and a beer belly, and he's about as gay as you get. Ma, give it a rest. It's the first time I have ever read a script where I knew, I knew I'd be really good in this role. And I felt so confident that I picked up the phone and I called Showtime. <laughs> and I asked to talk to Jerry Offsay, who ran it. I didn't know Jerry, but I knew his... I did too, he didn't take my call. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I'd like to do the mother. He says, you know, I like the idea. Sharon, I think you'll bring a little class to the project. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Jerry, class is not what I had in mind. <laughs> my God, have you ever seen anything more beautiful? Venice. At sunset. Fine. You go down the Grand Canal, I'll go down on him. When Showtime debuted Queer as Folk on December 3rd, 2000, it was the highest rated premiere the network had seen in three years. Yeah, it was very impressive. The reaction to the show was pretty amazing. When we ha when it was premiered in New York, it was at a really big movie theater up on Broadway. And the audience was astonished because they'd never seen anything like gasps. that they'd never seen themselves before, and they were thrilled. And we were thrilled. So you can do it with both of them? You can do anything you want. I just remember, I just popped in my head, uh, the New York premiere, and uh, there was a moment during the premiere when Randy's character, when Justin takes his shirt off and goes out into the club, and the entire audience erupted into applause and I had chills from head to toe, and I'll never forget that moment. And it was like this moment, I'm getting chills right now, it was this moment of liberation and freedom and expression. And I remember watching you on screen going, yeah, f yeah. And just that moment will always live inside me. It was one of the earliest things we shot, so I think in a way it was kind of helped instruct everybody else who started to shoot after that what, what was going to be required of them since we went for it. Great. Go to it. Where are you headed? No place special. I can change that. In 2000, Queer as Folk premiered on Showtime to rave reviews. And by the end of the first season, it was the highest rated show on the network. Good boy. You get an A plus. It was immediately clear that audiences were hungry for a show like Queer as Folk that gave a real intimate look at the life of the LGBT community. And this wasn't just for gay and lesbian people to watch. Straight people as well were riveted by these real people telling real stories about real relationships. This was an opportunity to really write about gay people, give them some depth and address issues that had never been seen. There were so many issues that we talked about on the show, gay bashing and HIV, safe sex, adoption, discrimination from your parents, from your religious leaders, and certainly from the government. The subject matter was not just 
uh, personal to the show. It was sociological, it was political, and there was a lot of ramifications. You can see a lot of seeds in, I think, a, a lot of the movement in society forward, and I think it not, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but I think some of those came directly from this show's existence. This is about speaking out, demanding to be heard whether people want to hear you or not. And it was something we're all proud of and we wanted to participate in and we wanted to help with as best we could, um, sometimes uh, by staying out of the way, but sometimes by showing up. And, uh, and we did that in, in groups together sometimes uh, and, and together as a whole a couple times. Okay. Uh, yeah. And there was a great deal of sex. He wanted to put me in short pants and spank me. I want to do a lot more than that. That's right. Mm -hmm. There was. There was, there was <laughs> a lot of sex. Amongst everyone. Yeah. There was a lot of nakedness. Yeah. Coming in? Huh? Oh, yeah. The very first scene we did was with uh, Gail and Randy, Brian and Justin, in this um, sort of monumental, epic sexual scene. So are you coming or going? Or coming and then going? And uh, I remember having a talk with them before we went. I said, you know, you were about to, to, to set the stage, to set the standard, the bar. <laughs> You're embarking on a journey where yeah. no man has gone right. before. And they were magnificent. They were magnificent. I mean, you had to make a choice right away. You're either really you're full commitment or you, you made the wrong decision. So, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Go to it. And it was one of the earliest things we shot. So I think in a way it was kind of helped instruct everybody else who started to shoot after that what, what was going to be required of them since we went for it. It also kind of opened the door psychologically to whatever would happen next. Diving in like that, anything was on the table at that point. You know, once we survived that, I mean, like, you know, the leaving the set that when we wrapped, it was kind of like the bells were just ringing, you know? Didn't you get enough last night? There is no such thing as enough. The next day was much easier in every way. And it was a nice, it was a nice starting point because it, it just felt freeing in a weird way. That's not how it felt at the time, but I think in retrospect, it kind of gave us the key, you know? Good night, sweetie. Next time we'll feed him together. The first uh, scene that Tay and I shot, uh, we were in bed and we were, you know, fooling around. And I remember Tay and I got together the night before and we actually practiced kissing because it was very important, I know, to me um, that they had that intimacy, that it wasn't just uh, sex for a straight man to get off on. It was, it was a real intimate connection between these two women who loved each other and had been together for so long. And so to show up and to have a partner, an actor, who there was immediate trust, and we immediately went into the work and created this bond. I really um, felt a great connection to Michelle when we first met, and we didn't have a lot of time to rehearse and to get to know each other, so that kind of instant connection was very strong. And I think the sexuality and the honesty of that sexuality was um, what propelled us throughout the whole series. I guess that's all we can do for now. <laughs> you know, the sex is so much a part of Poor's Foe, but it's not just having sex. Sex means... It's not gratuitous. We went back to his place, and we started fooling around, and I told him to stop. Why? Because it didn't mean anything. It was just sex. There was always a psychological or story reason for doing the sex. It, right. this, it wasn't just sex for sex sake, but it was very much an integral and important. I think it was the most political thing we did on the show was to show that gay people do have sex. How'd you like to make friends with my buddy here? I have dreamt about this moment all my life. And we grew up our entire lives going to movies and watching TV and seeing straight people rolling around in bed. And, and we said, well, we've never seen gay people do that. We have a lifetime to make up for here. And we're going to take advantage of it. And they said I'd never be any good at outdoor <laughs> sports. And we were going to say, well, this time, you're going to see real gay people doing what they really do. And it might shock you and it might offend you. Uh, 
but this is how it is. It's one of the things I actually don't think the show gets enough credit for is using sexuality as a fundamental part of storytelling, mm -hmm. of seeing people in yes. the most intimate. It was like us and Sex in the City, and those women, basically, they all wore bras in bed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, it's, it's, I think we were at the forefront of that, what has now become the sort of standard of cable and streaming um, right. storytelling. I don't want you dating that guy. I don't care what you want. As Debbie Novotny, all she knows is this man is going to kill him. I know what I want and I'll do anything to get it. You mean me? Yeah, I mean you. In 2000, Queer as Folk premiered on Showtime and quickly became the number one drama on the network. Can't be proud just this one time is only for gay people. In season two, Cowan and Lipman decided to introduce a brand new character. My name is uh, Ben. Ben Bruckner. The role of Professor Ben Bruckner went to Robert Gant. The 34-year-old actor had guest starred in a number of hit TV series, including Ellen, Melrose Place, and Friends. We never said this was exclusive. Yeah, neither did we. Give yourself a break. We haven't been going out that long. Come on, we, we haven't even slept together yet. <laughs> you haven't? You have? Okay, well this is none of my business. <laughs> ben is a college professor who teaches gay studies, and we first meet him in the comic book shop when he comes to ask Michael for comic book references for a class he's teaching. I'm um, looking for works that, uh, based on their uh, narrative, their graphics, cultural references, subtextual points of view, one might regard as, um, Okay. Right, right. They begin dating, but reach a speed bump when Ben reveals that he's HIV positive. Eventually, they're able to work through those issues, and they become one of the main long-term relationships of the series. To Michael, beneath his mild-mannered appearance beats the heart of a superhero. I don't know what to say. <laughs> no words required. How about this? I read this description, and it was one of those things where, like, that's me. And it said, uh, he's a professor, and I was an English major, and like, that's so why I got excited about that. And he's uh, just as comfortable uh, uh, on the dance floor as he is in the classroom. And, you know, as a like, gay man, I've certainly done my journey with, like, uh, the whole coming out and nightclubs and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and that kind of duality was, was very much a part of my experience. Says Michael is some hottie. I remember the first time I saw you finally on the set, we all went, oh my God, <laughs> he's gorgeous. <laughs> remember? We were all just kind of. Oh. I want to see how you were. After my big announcement, you're not freaked out. Please, right after my mother told me I was gay, she gave me this big safe sex lecture. I, I knew how to put a condom on a cucumber before I knew how to drive. One of the storylines we're proudest of is the um, relationship between uh, Michael and Ben being HIV positive and negative. I'm in good shape now, but I can't promise that I'll always be. But there is no always. There's only now. That's all we have. Isn't that what you're always telling me? I think one of the episodes that we got the most attention for was uh, Sharon Glass's character, Debbie, who was so liberal and so loving of her son. And then when she realizes that he is going to have a boyfriend who's HIV positive. She doesn't want any. She doesn't want to want anything to do with this person. He's my son. I don't want him getting anything. I never thought I'd say this. But for the first time in my life, I wish my son wasn't gay. People were, were furious. They said, well, you, you created this character who's so loving, and we love her, and why would she respond this way? Because she's human. You always wanted a normal mother? Okay, you got one. I don't want you dating that guy. I don't care what you want! As Debbie Novotny, all she knows is this man is going to kill him. My son is f this man and he's going to die because of it and that's the position she took what's your t-cell count uh it's 600 ever been hospitalized no not yet not good on the cocktail antivirals what the f do you think you're doing 
this is the reality, sweetheart. And you're just gonna have to live with it. She wasn't perfect. And it was, it was terrible how she treated this one, terrible. And, and finally, um, many, many episodes later, yeah. they wrote a lovely scene and you're in the hospital. Do you remember that? And, um, <laughs> and I had to come in and apologize to him. It's hard to write endings, if I may say, like that are gonna be satisfying for everybody. We don't need rings or vows to prove that we love each other. We already know that. I must say, probably my favorite moment of the show was a speech that Scott Lowell as Ted gave. Since God is love and God doesn't make mistakes, then you must be exactly the way he wants you to be, the way he intended you to be. He said that um, God uh, intended everyone to be who they are, you know, every, whatever, I'm paraphrasing. So God didn't make mistakes. And that goes for every person, every planet, every mountain, every grain of sand, every song, every tear, and every faggot. And it was a very moving speech, and that was the impetus for the show. That, and also the celebration of being gay, and um, the uh, idea that uh, you have to find your own, create your own family. And I think that's what brought people back. Queer as Folk ran for five seasons and earned six GLAD nominations, including one win for Best Drama. But after six years and 83 episodes, the groundbreaking series came to an emotional end on August 7th, 2005. I think they were trying to work it out for another season and it just, for various contractual reasons, it was gonna be they couldn't afford difficult to make, to make happen. Yeah. And yeah, I think this was at the usual annual you know, lunch towards the end of filming season four, we were told that season five is gonna be the last. So I think, yeah, it was great to have that time to prep and prepare and trust that the writers and Dan and Ron would, you know. Shepherd it well. Shepherd it well sunset. and, and, and finish the stories the way they saw it. And, you know, it's hard to do. Holy sh What? Heading into the series finale, Brian and Justin are finally going to get married. This is something fans had been waiting for for all five seasons. You look good. Bad. Laughable. Beautiful. This wedding seemed like the perfect way to put a bow on this entire series, but everything goes haywire. Every day we get closer to being married, the person I know gets further away. I'm right here, but it's not you. Brian and Justin have this really pivotal moment lying together in bed where they speak their true feelings. I don't want to live with someone who sacrificed their life and called it love to be with me. <sighs> Neither do I. And realize that they have to be true to themselves or they'll never really be happy. <laughs> We would like to thank you all for coming to our rehearsal dinner. Ah. <laughs> However, there's nothing to rehearse. The wedding's off. They wind up calling off the wedding, and Justin chooses to pursue his dream of becoming an artist and moves to New York City. The audience is left wondering what's going to happen to this former couple. I'll be back. And you'll come there. We're going to see each other all the time. You don't know that. And a lot of faithful fans were very distressed because Brian and Justin did not go off and get married or, or um, uh, stay together. Um, they wanted a happy ending, and we wanted a more realistic ending. Whether we see each other next weekend or next month, never again. It doesn't matter. It's only time. It's hard to write endings, if I may say, like that are going to be satisfying for everybody, especially when it's, again, this relationship-based drama and there's will they or won't they and all that kind of stuff. And there's some people who want some people together, there's some people who don't want some people together. And, and, and so it's difficult, but Dan and Ron had to be true to what they felt and how they saw these characters. We don't need rings or vows to prove that we love each other. 
We already know that. Brian and Justin were sort of um, um, above the other characters uh, in terms of their own morality, I feel, and, and their code. They didn't need they didn't need a ceremony. They don't need rings. Uh, they may go off and have their separate lives and their sexual separate sexual partners, but they are bonded. They are linked together. You did it. I did what? And that, to me, was very essential. We didn't really want them to go off into the sunset like some of the other characters did. Became the best homosexual you could possibly be. I'm sorry if it sounds egotistical, but I think Brian and Justin are a classic love story and an unusual love story that really no one had ever seen before and not, not too much since. It was such a unique experience and such a unique show that these are the people that, oh, I always cry, but the, I only can look to you and you can only look to me to remember those memories together. years after the series finale, Queer as Folk remains as relevant as ever with brand new audiences binge watching online. We stopped making this like 90 years ago and people still <laughs> are discovering it for the first discovering time. Discovering for the first time yeah. and think it's real. I mean, it's it's like, it's, it's lovely. I mean, it's a wonderful tribute to the writers, to Dan and Ron and all the writers on the show, to our crew, to everybody that this thing felt in an odd way like docudrama, uh, to a world of many people knew nothing about, and now they do, and now they're as passionate about uh, these issues uh, as anybody. It was such a unique experience and such a unique show that these are the people that, oh, I always cry, but the, I only can look to you and you can only look to me to remember those memories together. We are the only two people, women, who went through those memories together, and so it's family. I mean, it's family. Forever. Everyone smile, please. I, I think it's actually so thrilling to know that young gay people are watching the show because they didn't grow up with all the stuff that we were dealing with right. at That's the turn point. of the 21st century. Uh, we all went through a lot of a lot of stuff, so they come to the show with a very different point of view. But the one similarity I find between the young people now and the people back then that they've all said is that you showed me. I saw myself and that meant so much to people. And the other thing they all say is in watching your show, I knew I wasn't alone. And I think that's a blessing. Along with that, I too, I think, you know, the, the circumstances have changed. God knows the clothes and the hairstyles have changed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but the emotional stories are, they're eternal. They're the same stories Shakespeare was writing about. They're the same, you know, I, I often say um, people came for the queer, they stayed for the folk. <laughs>